I'm Dean Newland, and welcome to the Business of Intuition, where I coach, facilitate, train, and speak on the hard science and meaningful experience of intuitive leadership in business, so you can make better decisions, forge real connections, and creatively solve problems to amplify your impact and simplify your life. Welcome to the Business of Intuition. Are you tired of feeling disconnected from your true self? Or do you struggle to trust your intuition and make authentic decisions? The situation is that many of us deny ourselves the opportunity to fully embrace our emotions and feelings, therefore hindering our ability to tap into our inner wisdom. Also, the problem lies in varying experiences, avoiding emotions, and holding on to limiting beliefs that keep us stuck. One solution lies in the transformative power of hypnotherapy and positive self-talk. By upgrading our belief system, embracing our emotions with compassion, and rewiring our subconscious mind, we can unlock our authenticity and trust our intuition. My next guest on the business of intuition describes a journey of self-discovery and provides tips on how to live a life guided by our truest and highest best self. Christina Woods is a licensed RTT therapist, clinical hypnotherapist, advanced theta healer, empowerment coach, Reiki master, and the CEO and founder of Wise Woods. She combines her background in corporate leadership along with her life experiences in dealing with trauma in abandonment to empower other men and women to trust their intuition and set themselves free of self-doubt. She has been honing her intuition in spirituality and energy practice throughout her entire life, and it is this experience, knowledge, and wisdom that she brings to every client. Through deep hypnotherapy and coaching work, she empowers women and men to shed old programming so they can live the life they deserve. Christina wants everyone to stop looking outside for what they need and instead look inside. Christina Woods on the business of intuition. Well, so Christina, uh, great to have you on the show. I think I want to start off by some clarification here. Um, we've had a lot of people on this show over the last, geez, it's been two years or so, two and a half years that have been in the industry of coaching and or the uh, some sort of ancillary support service around that. Give us some definitions around what's the difference between coaching and hypnotherapy? How do they operate differently? How are they similar? Sure. Well, hypnotherapy, what we're doing is we are finding out what are the programs, what are the stories, and I'll even go as far as to say what are the lies that are running the show because our our you know, we have a subconscious mind and our conscious mind. And our conscious mind is our our thinking, our analytical mind. We need it. It's important, but it's only about 5% of what's running the show. Our feeling mind, our emotions, our subconscious mind is 95%. So in hypnotherapy, we go into your subconscious and we find out, all right, why do you feel the way you feel about yourself, your place in the world, where, you know, how, why you allow certain things or don't have boundaries or have boundaries. So we go into your subconscious and find out what are these programs? What are these stories that have shaped how you feel about yourself and the place, your place in the world? And, and from there, we can do coaching from there. But we need to find out first, what's the voice? What's the stories? What are the programs? And get to the root first. Otherwise, it's just a Band-Aid and a bunch of affirmations. So I think somebody told me once, and you probably know this better than I do, that is it somewhere like around 90% of our behaviors are influenced by our subconscious versus conscious mind? Is that close? Well, yeah, it's absolutely 90, 95%. So what's interesting is that, you know, our emotions always trump logic, yet, you know, we get really frustrated with ourselves when we say, gosh, I know that. I know I shouldn't do that. I know that that isn't good for me. Or why did I get so angry? Or why did I say that? Or why did I eat that? Or why, why do I wait so long to prepare for this presentation? Or why do I procrastinate 
So logically, we get annoyed or frustrated, but emotionally, subconsciously, there is something driving that behavior, that thought, that pattern. And subconsciously is the power. Subconsciously is what's driving 95%. It's the iceberg. What's below the water? So you hear people say that I want to make a decision not based on emotions or let's not get emotional about this decision. Let's, let's be more logical. Let's, let's get, let's get emotions out of it. Mm -hmm. I've had members of my family, which I adore would say, I'm trying to teach my kids to make decisions based on their intellect versus their emotion. Mm -hmm. Is that a false statement? Is that even possible to do that? Given the fact that 90 or 95% of what's going on is subconscious. Is this just a false premise? It's a great question. So at first, you know, we are programmed, our society is programmed to, you know, praise the logic and praise intellect and, you know, does it make sense? And what are the pros and cons? But listening to yourself and what feels right, because many, many times we make decisions and our, it doesn't feel right, but we're doing it because perhaps logically or it says it should be the right decision. So I think teaching our children what feels right and, and under, entrusting their gut is important. But also if your patterns, if your patterns are influenced by something that's protecting you, if you not feeling good enough is so that you stay small, if anxiety is keeping you small and that's what's protecting you from wanting to go public, do public speaking, then then we need to look at why you feel that way. Why is, why is that yeah. your emotional and your feeling? So it doesn't mean that all of our, our, our emotions are the truth. It means we need to kind of peel, the, peel it back and find out, all right, why do I always feel not good enough? Because that isn't necessarily the truth. We're not born not feeling good enough. A baby can, can have food all over its face and it's still smiling and thinks it's perfect. It's not until we get older and say, oh, I got to look perfect. I got to be perfect. I have, enough, I have to have all these things for people to value me. We aren't born this way. So is the pathway our feelings? I mean, is that the, the vehicle to be able to, one, I guess this is what this is, I, I, I think about this sometimes, especially when it comes to intuition, or just to say, how do you know when this intuitive, quote unquote, feeling mm -hmm. is the truth? And how do you know it is some sort of subconscious lie? that is holding you back. How do we know that this is the right intuitive impulse or is it my subconscious mind keeping me from my highest and best because of some sort of program perspective that I had when I was when I was 10? Right. How do you determine which is which? Yeah, is it a fear? Is it my intuition? What yeah. is it? Yeah. You know, what, what are the patterns? What are, what are the results? Let's look at your life. What, look at your relationships. Look at what's going on in your life. Are you happy? Are you satisfied? Look at, look at the patterns. Look at your bank account. Look at your relationships. Look at your health. Look at your life. So many, many times people will look at me and say, there's no way I'm going to trust relationships. I'm done with them. They are, they're all terrible. You know, there's no way love sucks. I'm not doing it anymore. It's like, well, OK, yes, you have been burned. Yes, these relationships have not been good. But the answer isn't that they'll all be this way. Let's look at why you've chosen relationships where people take advantage or you have no boundaries or let's take a look at that pattern because, yes, those relationships were not healthy for you. And you should trust that, yes, you've chosen partners, perhaps that did not respect your boundaries. But let's go dig and find out what's going on there. Why? Why is that pattern? So look at, are you, ha are you happy? Does it feel right or does it not feel right? And, and that is where we get so off kiltered. We don't even know what's a fear and what's our intuition anymore. Right. That's, what, that's kind of what I'm getting at is that there could be alarm bells mm, mm -hmm. around something that is truly an intuitive, non- if not being laden or polluted, if that's the wrong word, by some sort of old tapes or programming that is keeping us from that truth. And yet at the same time, it might feel like a concern, you know, like this isn't, this isn't the right thing to do, you know? So I think that that's always the, the, the piece of, I, the way I describe it sometimes is 
the intuition when it's really tapped in is there's a certain amount of, I don't know how to describe it. It feels like there's a certain amount of peace or certain amount of knowing, even if that knowing is going to cause me to do something that I may not want to do because of there's consequences to it. There's a person I need to talk to. There's something I need to do or not do that I know is, but there's some sort of, I don't know how to put it. Right. And I do, when I work with clients, everyone has their own sense of what this intuition will feel like. So is it a sense of, of just a knowing? Okay. And, you know, you almost have to just lean into it and try it before you start to feel like, yeah, I know what that knowingness feels like. And we, you know, the more you find the courage to lean in and trust your intuition, and you can do it with baby things. You can even just start to trust your feelings because that's where I find most people, they can't even trust how they feel when, when they come to me, you know, even just feeling their feelings. We have denied ourselves just feeling our feelings. We're so afraid of our feelings. If we could actually just feel our feelings, that allows us to lean in and trust our intuition or denying ourselves emotions and sadness, sad and guilt and any any emotion and feeling, that's how we start to tap into ourselves and something much bigger, something divine within us that we all have is our our true north, this intuition and our voice that's telling us this doesn't feel right. Or, you know, even on my own journey, it was, you know, why do I always do this? Why do I keep getting raises? Why do I keep getting promotions? My bank account's not getting any bigger. What's going on? I need to get curious about this. I need to I, I need to look at this from a different perspective. Something's, you know, something, this doesn't look right. And so, you know, just even just getting curious about certain things can really start to awaken your intuition. Like there's a pattern here I need to investigate, right? What's the relationship between authenticity and intuition? And, and tell me where you're going with it. Tell me what you mean. I'm just wondering if you see that they are the one and the same. Are we... Are they cousins? Are they married together? Do we, like the authenticity, I guess, would be almost yeah. what is that core truth, right? What is that highest and best divine part of that person unencumbered by limiting thoughts and false beliefs, right? Oh, it's, yeah. It's the core. Is that another way of saying once you have accomplished that or you feel that in that moment, you're also intuitive? Absolutely. I absolutely connect the two, you know, and and that's to when you start to connect to your intuition, there is just a sense of freedom to be your authentic self. You can lean in and, you know, a sense of freedom. Like I don't necessarily need to over explain or you don't have to explain or justify. It's like, this is who I am. This doesn't feel right. I'm excited about this. I'm not excited about this. I don't want to do this. I want to do this. It's like, it's this authentic who I am. You know, I, I left a 30 year corporate career that was, you know, high six figures, still had the mortgage, still had the kids in college. And, but it wasn't speaking to my authentic self anymore. It was, it was something of a shell that just didn't excite me anymore. People thought I was insane to leave that. But once you start to tune in to, wait, that, that just isn't who I am. It's not who I am anymore. And you lean into just trusting there's something else or something that you want or something you desire, or just a voice within, then being your authentic self or tapping into whatever gifts you have, whatever gifts you have, doesn't matter what they are, then just leaning into decisions through your intuition is just freedom. And yes, I believe that is complete authenticity. It sounds like one of the um, benefits, outcomes, final destination, if you will, is that trust, is the trust in self, the trust in voice, the trust in intuition, the trust in, in ourselves. It sounds like, if I could summarize, that's one of the things that one would experience through all this. Absolutely. You know, these, these subconscious beliefs are just these these lies and stories and really other voices within our subconscious that make us believe things about ourselves that we hear from, you know, the collective consciousness, from media, from our families, from religion, from, it doesn't even matter, the community that we live in, schools. 
And most of them have nothing to do with us. It's just, you know, and, and to no fault of anyone, it's just, you know, just existing and living we start to believe things around us. And the more the more and more we start to become aware, we start to realize, wait a second, that isn't even true. And I might have believed that at four or five years old, and we start to figure out why. But through hypnotherapy, you're able to find out, wow, that wasn't that might have been necessary for me to believe about myself then. But I'm I'm 40, I'm 50 now. That doesn't even make sense. That that isn't something I need to protect myself or doesn't align with my life now. And hypnotherapy at that point is just a science of rewiring and upgrading your beliefs. I mean, we beliefs, we upgrade our phone, we upgrade our computers, but we so often don't realize we need to upgrade our beliefs, our belief system so that we can, like you said, start to, to trust that voice. I love the analogy. I think we could all relate to that. Um, <laughs> how do we then get to our upgraded belief system to, you know, go from version 12.0 to 14.5. I mean, how does that process work? So once you find out what, what the beliefs are and why they're there, you have to get to the root cause. And how so, do you get to that? I mean, yeah, if, if yeah. Our 90, 90 or 95% subconscious that's running the show, 10% or 5% is we think we're running the show, but we're really yeah. not, right? Yeah. How do we get underneath the veil? To That's find out point. what's going on. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, hypnotherapy is one method. There are some other methods, but by going into an alpha brainwave or a theta brainwave, what we do is we quiet that noisy analytical conscious mind that can make us say, well, you know, this very, very, you know, chatty little voice that we have that says that doesn't make sense. Why would you ever think that? That, you know, that doesn't logically make sense. You've never thought that before. We quiet that. And we allow us to go into this theta or alpha brainwave, which is, by the way, we go there very often throughout the day. So if we've ever driven home and you get in your driveway and you think, I don't remember, actually, did I stop at that light? Mm -hmm. Did I turn? I don't even remember turning right. Here I am at home and I don't remember anything. It's our autopilot. So we don't really think about eating anymore. We just put the spoon to our mouth. But when we were kids, we actually had to think about it. We would miss our mouth. So these beliefs are on autopilot. So we go through, we slow down our conscious mind and we go through hypnotherapy or another method and we find out and we ask the mind, when did I start to believe these things about myself? And we find out and you go back and you're able to look at them and see things from a different perspective. And when you can go back, Dean, and look at something and say, wow, I can see these points in my life when I started to believe I wasn't enough. Um, I was in a junior high. I was in high school when I was 20. This is when I started to form this belief that made me doubt myself. And it started to become the truth about me. I can see why I believed it, but it isn't the truth about me. So from there, we get the root and then we rewire in the truth and powerful words. The mind responds to words and images. So then by listening to an audio recording that's customized, just for you over and over and over, about 15, 20 minutes, and using powerful images and words over and over, you listen, and it literally rewires through neuroplasticity a new neuropathway with a new belief system. So your mind wants to move you towards pleasure and away from pain. So if you've associated something towards pleasure, you've really got to figure out what what do you associate with pleasure and what do you associate with pain? If Having anxiety keeps you away from painful experiences, keeps you locked in your house, not being social because social being social connects you, maybe makes you connect with people, makes you feel uh, less than, not articulate, you feel stupid. Well, then you bet that anxiety is going to hang around because it keeps you away from pain. So we need to start connecting different things to pleasure and different things to pain. Added, there's so much here. I'm just uh, scribbling notes all over the place here, <laughs> Christina. Um, yeah. I guess, is there, I, I can see where the, uh, that a person, and when we're saying hypnotherapy, just to be clear, we're talking about some, the word hypno, it represents hypnosis. And that's where this, this different state that you're talking about can help us get to the subconscious. And I wonder if, the, if you sometimes hear people would say, 
Yeah, I now know where this started. It happened mm-hmm. on the playground when I was at 10 or whatever. Sure. Is there, do you hear from people the concern that if I focus on that, understand that so much, that I might just continue to attract more of it? Is there a thought in the therapy community that says, if you focus on something, you're going to bring it to you? How much is that? How much do we need to be able to put attention on these old beliefs without them becoming something that they're sticky even more? You know, there is a belief. And I think most most people believe in it's called avoid it. Avoid of, you know, I don't want to feel it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to feel it. Let's bury it. And therefore it will go away. And it doesn't go away. It gets bigger and hairier. And, you know, they, there's that quote about a, a tear that's not shed will find another organ to weep. And uh. the, the emotions that we bury, the experiences that we bury, we choose not to look at, you know, they just come out in, in illness or anxiety or something else. And so, you know, by, by looking at something, it doesn't mean we're creating a magnet. It means we're looking and understanding and allowing compassion for ourselves. We're looking at it and saying, wow, I really understand with compassion and self-love and understanding. So we look at it like a movie and say, that made a lot of sense. Anyone at that age in that situation would have felt that way. But it's very empowering then to say, guess what? I'm not in that situation anymore. I don't, I don't have that family anymore. I don't live in that environment anymore. It's actually part of the process we go through and coaching process where we remove ourselves and, and, and really upgrade and say, this is where you live now. This is what your life is like now. This is why, and to, to show you where you've upgraded and using really powerful descriptive words, the mind just latches onto those things. Even if you don't do hypnotherapy, asking yourself, how do you talk to yourself? You know, what are you mm-hmm. saying to yourself? Because we can stay in victim mode for the rest of our lives. You know, I had a, I had a, you know, terrible childhood. I had this, I had that. You know, I understand that with compassion. So did I. And we could live there forever. Um, we need to tell our minds something different and really, really be careful about what we say because our mind really is listening to every word you say and every image you create. And it literally doesn't care if what you're saying to yourself is right or wrong or good or bad. It doesn't right. care. Right. So, so I'll, I'll one more. Uh, sort of follow up question on this vein of discussion Mm -hmm. and then we can move on to something else. Can a person change a core belief through, let's call it, creating new beliefs, affirmations, who they hang with, experiences they have without going deep and really digging into where the negative belief started? Like maybe there's a sort of a tertiary high level. I know that I've got childhood issues regarding death, right? <laughs> Instead of going back and finding out the time and date and when these things happened and to really find out the mm-hmm. source, could we just simply say, I know that, but I'm going to move more towards associating myself with positive people. I'm going to do some belief work around where I'm heading to more mm-hmm. focus based on the future versus mm-hmm. on the path. Can that also be successful? Is that another process that could work? Yeah, it can work and it does work for some people. But when, you know, when you have, even if it's small trauma, you know, we use the little trauma or the big trauma. When you have these moments and and you go back and we don't need the date and time. We don't need to time stamp it. We don't need to stare at it. We don't need to relive it and refeel every moment. It's just when you have an understanding and clarity on something, you have power. And you're gaining your power back. So when, you know, you want something to last and we find I have many, many clients that will come back to me and say, you know, I tried this. It worked for five years. I stopped smoking for 10 years. I lose the weight and it comes back. You know, it's not that we don't know what to do or we don't know how to feel. We don't know what to say to ourselves. But why does the why does it always come back? Why do we repeat? Why do we repeat some of these patterns and behaviors? It's just like weeding my garden outside. If I don't go and get the roots, they're coming back. So it is very important to go and find out what is the root cause to begin with. Otherwise, we do find these patterns. They just kind of come back in a different way, you know, yeah. different form. 
So from a micro to a macrocosm. So thank you for describing that process for an individual. Mm -hmm. Let's now bring it into a a little larger group. Say it's um, a family or say it's a team in an organization. Yeah. We've been around for a long time. We got a history. Some of the history hasn't been so positive. We have some of these uh, combined belief systems that we all have individually that has actually created the culture and the dynamics of the team based on the behaviors. Some of those particular behaviors have been developed by the interactions that we've had with each other. We might have some scar tissue with respect to the culture. Now we're going to come in, we're going to redesign the team, right? We're going to create a vision statement. We're going to think about what good looks like. We're going to help try to visualize and and identify the feelings and the, the the goals and the vision and the direction we're going to create. Can that work? Or do we need to, to your same point with respect to the individual, go back and sort of find root cause that's causing the team not to function as well as it should? It needs to be a little bit of finding out what's going on. What's, what's at the root of the culture? You know, is, is there fear? Is there, because you know, you could put a Band-Aid. I mean, there's plenty of cultures that have had the rah-rah meetings and the right. rah-rah resets. Right. And, you know, you brought in this the big company to bring in a new, you know, a new acronym, you know, with a new flavor. Yeah. But if if there's still fear in the culture, if there's still no boundaries with people's personal time, you know, if, th- if there's no trust, if there's those yeah. types of things, those pillars are still not there. I think that's core. So, you know, doing doing some work and finding out when I work with corporations, you know, we really got to find out what are those core issues, those underlying issues, because again, those things would just be putting band-aids on some of the core energy that's that's preventing a real change in culture. No, I, and I think, you know, going back to the word we used before is around trust, you know, the trust yeah. of the individual, knowing where they're, that, that, uh, that inner intuitive knowing voices and their trust to be able to follow that and, and be able to live in that area. I think the same is true for a team. You can't yeah. grow an organization very well if you don't have trust to support it, sort of like the yes. lifeblood of a body. Yes. And so, you know, let's build up that trust first as a building block to be able to get to other things. Having to do with goals and process and all the other things that go with that. Totally get that. So tell me something else that's off the topic, but I'm sure related. You mentioned that um, in your information that you know I read through about you, this process yeah. called RTT. What yeah. does it stand for and what is it? Yeah, that is the method of hypnotherapy that I use. It's called rapid transformational therapy. Right. And it is a little bit, you know, it's a, a technique and a method created by Marissa Peer. She's actually been voted number one therapist in the UK many, many years and very, very well-known author, speaker around the world. And what's incredible about it is that, you know, there's this idea that for therapy or to really change how we believe and feel, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time. You have to be on someone's couch every Friday for 10 years. Right, and, right. Um, you know, what she's just, effect. yeah, yeah. And she's just flipped that upside down, you know, in two or three sessions, you can have this complete set of new beliefs and changes in your life. I mean, uh, this is the average two, three sessions. So, you know, they're about mm. two hours. So it's it's very deep. It gets to the root. We rewire. We get to the root. We rewire, reframe these new beliefs. So it's it's rapid. It's transformational. And some hypnotherapy is... It's all works on the subconscious, but her technique is getting to the root that we've been discussing. And it's she just really just laughs at anyone that says it's got to take long and you got to drag it out. And that's the only way it's worth, you know, going to be worth it. You know, baloney, it, it doesn't need to be. You need to go there. You need to feel it. You need to find it. And let's let's do this. Let's rewire. You are very powerful and we all have intuition and let's tap into it and Find out what's getting in the way. Fascinating. That's great. So without uh, getting into saying, I'm going to hire you or somebody else to, because I do totally believe in the the process of having somebody assist somebody else, you know, mm-hmm. um, 
Yeah. I suppose I wouldn't be in this industry if I didn't think that that, that it takes a village to kind of create a, a, you know, a child and a, and a team and, you know, society pulling together and helping each other out is yes. it's extremely important. I mean, we can quadruple our overall benefit if we can just bring other people involved with that. So I totally uh, support and love what you do. Is there something that person listening to this, as we sort of wrap this conversation up and say, God, if there was just a couple of things that I would be aware of before calling a you know, person like yourself, what would that be? What can they do to kind of take a step forward Yeah, that might be useful based on the things that you talked about today? Yeah. Pay attention to how they are talking to themselves. What are you saying to yourself? I mean, really, you don't need to tell anyone. But, you know, be honest. Are you saying, oh, that never works out for me? Or I'm just not somebody that ever is going to find love. Other people make money. You know, what, what are you saying to yourself? And say, just change the dialogue and see what happens. So how are you speaking to yourself? And find quiet time. So whether that's in the morning, whether that's before you go to bed, uh, whether that's through meditation or journaling, but quiet time. You know, you don't always have to be listening to something or watching something or doing something, but that quiet time, really uh, just allowing your mind and are you, can you even hear yourself, you know, right. just breathing, doing something like that. It's so important and it's, it's takes some discipline because we're movers, aren't we? Move, move, move. So yeah. that, that can really have profound changes. A, a morning routine to me is one of the biggest things that I do with people in the beginning is something that can make big shifts in your life. Yes. Yeah. That morning routine. I love that thought around setting the intention and setting the tone for the day. Yes. And being able to carry that forward within the, the rest of the day. Um, I think that, you know, athletes, I was just talking to somebody about this before this interview, you're we talking about sports and about how People who are at the top of their game are setting the tone for what they're about to do, whether it's mm -hmm. swimming or skiing or what have you. Then we can do the same thing for our interactions with our families. We can set the tone for going into a meeting, you know, kind of clearing from where we were, getting into what do I intend for this to be? Mm -hmm. How do I want my energy to, to tap? How do I want to tap into that energy? That, uh, that'll make a big difference in how I'm showing up, but probably it's going to make a difference in terms of how other people react to me. I think this is, this is just great advice. Yeah. And our mind is always looking for evidence to back up how we feel. So, you know, if we're feeling lousy, we're going to find lots of evidence throughout the day to back that up. And if we're starting to say some positive things about ourselves, we'll start to notice a little bit more evidence that backs up those positive things. And then that just sort of is this beautiful loop. And you start to notice the actions and more and more evidence and see your life change. That's a great point. Well, Christine, this is really fascinating stuff. I really appreciate your insights and your approach to this wonderful work. How can people follow you? Uh, tell us about uh, your business and, and how can we connect? Yeah, thank you so much. So my business is Wise Woods Hypnotherapy, and I'm mostly on Instagram, which is at Wise Woods Hypnotherapy. And I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one work. I have retreats. Um, I also have a free download on my website, which is wisewoods.com. It's a hypno meditation, which just kind of gives you an idea of flavor of what this all feels like and looks like. And I offer a, an hour a consultation if anyone wants to kind of pick my brain a little bit about what this is all about. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has just been fascinating. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you for listening to The Business of Intuition. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about Dean or Mission Facilitators Leadership, go to mfileadership.com. That's mfileadership.com.